There was a woman who was stopped at a red light. She was trying to get her engine started. She was stalled. Turning the key, mm, 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 mm. the engine wasn't turning over. It was, oh, frustrating because suddenly there was a line of cars forming behind her. Cars were lining up and there was one directly behind her who was quite impatient, a young man who laid on the horn. Honk, 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 honk. You know, you probably have been there. You probably experienced something similar. The woman was in panic, not knowing what to do. She just simply got out of her car and walked over to the car behind her where the gentleman was still laying on the horn. And she simply said, excuse me, would you be so kind enough to help me? I can't seem to get my car started. Would you go there and try? I'll stay in your car and lay on the horn for you. <laughs> you know, in life, sometimes we're awfully impatient and we want to get somewhere quickly. We want to move through life and we know that life is this wonderful journey. But yet we would love to see the power of our manifesting being in this express lane where we're moving in such a way that that which we believe for, what we're trusting for, it's moving in divine right order. It's coming in the right process. It's moving in the right and divine time in life. You know how it is sometimes we get impatient and we kind of want to lay on the spiritual horn. Honk, honk, honk. God, why are you not moving? Honk, honk, honk. What's stalled? What's the engine? What's slowing it down? What's keeping this wonderful blessing from unfolding in my life? We get impatient. But we do like to travel in the express lane, don't we? I love to get in that express lane. I wish sometimes I had somebody else driving, riding with me so I could get into that HOV powerful place where you can zip through Atlanta because quite often you're bogged down and everybody else is just moving at a nice speed. There they go in that HOV lane. First of all, when I got here, I thought, HIV lane. Oh, isn't that nice? Isn't that considerate of all those people who are dealing with HIV? Oh, it's HOV, high occupancy vehicle. Okay, now we understand. In life's journey, we'd like to get to that express lane where we can move through life very quickly, smoothly, and easily. And the Bible has a lots of wonderful stories about journeys, people going on the journey, traveling on the journey, and one of the most powerful ones, of course, is the children of Israel coming out of Egypt on a wonderful journey. They say that actually from their original destination to the promised land was only about an 11-day journey. Do you ever wonder why it took them 40 years to travel that? Hmm? It's kind of amazing when we think because sometimes there was something in our lives or I think believing tr truly in their life that there was something creating a wandering reality. A wandering reality reality where their reality was all about i think we're just going to go in circles a little bit you know we're just going to go here we're going to go there we're going to go in circles we're just going to wander around a little bit because our, that was their consciousness that was their way of thinking there was a reality for them do you realize that we create our reality and we do so with our thoughts so everything we're thinking about, everything thought that comes, it's going to manifest and shapes your reality. It shapes your moment right here and now. What was creating this wandering reality? Aren't you intrigued? Wouldn't you like to know? I am, because what was creating the problem for them is that they held in mind was their thoughts. What they really held in mind was something that was creating their reality, and the thought was simply this. The thought was, their enemies are their problems. They looked to the promised land. In fact, they sent out some spies ahead to check it all out, who came back with wonderful stories saying, wow, it's full of milk and honey, shall we say. It's full of all kinds of blessings. It's full of all kinds of great things. And before you start talking too fancy and too highfalutin about how good the promised land is, some stood up and said, excuse me, there's giants there's lots of problems. You know those negative naysayers who always want to rain on everyone's parade. You've seen those in life. Do you realize, oh, you're talking about all this wonderful blessing. Let's not get carried away. You know, because we need to get our eyes focusing on the fact that there's going to be challenges, hardships, difficulties. We're going to face some big old giants. They're going to be in our way. There's going to be enemies there. Do you realize they're going to attack us? They're going to try to destroy us. Now, how many of you want to go into the promised land? Mm. Wow. They kind of presented a whole different perspective, didn't they? 
there was this wandering reality because they thought their enemies were the problem. The problem is, you see, quite often it's our story too, and we think our enemies are our problems, and we think our problems are our enemies. Interesting how this story is our story. And we wonder why we're wandering. It's because constantly we're thinking, this problem I have is an enemy and something I've got to work on trying to defeat. I've got to try to destroy this. Or this enemy is now my problem. But really when we understand our true divine nature is that we have no enemies, we have no problems, because God is with us. It's an interesting thought that we're not taught to first think from this standpoint that God is our deliverer, God is our strength, God is our victor, the power and presence of the divine within us is enabling us to do amazing things. No, what's our first thought? Houston, we've got a problem. That's the way we look at life. Suddenly, we're all kinds of experiences are coming our way, and we want to just call it all out. Do you not see the challenge? Do you not see the enemy before us? Do you not see how great this is that's standing in our way, and we become literally bogged down? No, you're not in the express lane. No, you're in 5 o'clock Atlanta traffic on Interstate 85. That's what it feels like spiritually. You're going about two miles an hour and you're feeling bogged down because you think that this is the only way that you can look at life. So many people think this is the only way. First, let's do an analysis of all the things that are going wrong. Let's do an analysis of all the things that are not working. Let's really highlight and list all the things that don't work in our lives so we can do some sort of analysis, maybe to set ourselves on right course. And so we're bogged down. We're thinking about all that's wrong instead of all that's right. Because let me tell you this, as a child of God, everything is right. When your mind is put in this consciousness. The beautiful passage of Scripture says, I can do all things through Christ. I can do all things through this wonderful consciousness and awareness. Wow, did you ever think about that? It's a scripture verse. Oh, well, it's just the Bible. You know, it's just those promises that we build our faith on. We don't really take them to heart, do we? We don't really believe in those things. There's some things we do and some things we just kind of toss aside, right? Oh, I hope not. Because if you are taking one passage of scripture to heart, let's take it all. And that is a beautiful passage that is really echoing for us, that really sets our daily thoughts that there is this one power. And this is the way we think, that there's this one presence. There's this one power and presence that's ever leading and guiding and is always with us, never leaving nor forsaking us. Wow. That means then I can do all things. So no matter what I look at, there is no enemy here. There's no problem here. Why? Because the divine is flowing in and through me. And suddenly we move out of that wandering reality. We move out of that kind of thought life. And we begin to shape and change our way of thinking to say, I know that I know that I know how all things are working together because it is in this divine presence that I rest. Now, here's the beautiful thing. I want you to know that the Bible does not tell you what to think. Contrary to a lot of our religious upbringing, we think, you know, preachers get up there and they say, I'm going to tell you what to think. I'm going to tell you what to think completely. Eh, Some of them have tried and we bought into it. But actually the Bible tells you how to think, not what to think. And when we start looking at Scripture as if it's something that's telling you, here's what to think, don't think, just take this, don't use your mind, don't use your brain. Don't you, you know, engage any consciousness or thinking on your own. Just believe this is what you will think, and that's good enough. Because Lord knows you ain't supposed to be thinking anyway as Christians. Well, that's kind of craziness, isn't it? When we're called to use all the facilities and faculties that God has given to us to use our mind to its fullest. So this wonderful thing is that the Scripture is telling us not what to think, but how. 
Wisdom then becomes our thinking tool as we seek it. And we refine that tool as we seek more of its insights. And we become powered with a righteousness or a right thinking or a way of thinking that's bringing about clarity that we can look at everything and we can find understanding and the evolution of truth within it. Let me give you some examples. Is it strange that sometimes we look at these Old Testament passages and we find Israelites discriminating against other tribes, groups, individuals? And we think, oh, isn't that way we should think? We should be very discrimination, discriminating. Yet the Bible says love one another. Ooh, wait a minute. Love one another, discriminate. Love one another, discriminate. How? Let's put it together. Let's use some common sense for the Bible is telling you then. How might we look at these passages that we thought were an invitation to discriminate and understand their symbolism? Just as the children of Israel speak of an enemy, they're really speaking of a problem. We're not called to have enemies. For the scripture itself unfolds for us this powerful truth of loving one another to such extent that you have no enemies. Of loving one another to such extent that you have no problems. Wow. Then we, be see, see, we begin to see how scripture comes alive. And we begin to understand. How about when we look at passages and we want to understand the Bible clearly, how about if you include with thou shalt not kill and blessed are the peacemakers when we read about God sending people into battle? Does that mean, wait a minute, one of us says let's go kill, war, let's fight, let's destroy, let's get the enemy. And the others, blessed are the peacemaker, thou shalt not kill. How do we put it all together? It's teaching you how to think. That many of those passages are offering more of a symbolic reference than a call to discriminate or go to war. How about treat everyone the way you'd like to be treated when you're reading about cultural separation between the Jews and the Samaritans? How about including Jesus' example of, ooh, get this racy one, dining with prostitutes? Hanging out with tax collectors? And then we read, wait a minute, be ye not unequally yoked. Wait a minute, there's Jesus yoking himself up, hooking himself up with the hookers. You know, what is going on here? You know, how do we analy analyze this scripture? Well, we put it all together with wisdom that helps us unfold and understand that when we put it together, the yoking is this wonderful way of saying, yes, we are not hooked up, connected in such a sense, but there's fellowship and there's the body where we're expanding out with love and care for one another in ways that we're building the body of Christ. Does that make sense? Does that make sense to you? Because that's really what the Bible is. It makes sense. It makes sense. But it's called for us to use this to think to think, to think. Now the children of Israel had problems with what they were thinking and they were in a wandering reality. So what's the secret to getting out of that and getting into the express lane? It's to begin to think with some divine thoughts, God thoughts, to think those wonderful ways as God would think, to ask those questions that we really understand how this text or scripture may be the guiding our life, that we really begin to understand, I need to think with some God thoughts, not human thoughts. Because I realize my human thoughts are kind of limited. Selfish, ego-based. Divine thoughts are so loving, tender, kind, compassionate, inclusive, Wow, there's a real difference. So how important is that we look, check to say that we're not carrying these chains of bondage of old thoughts and old ways, but welcoming divine thoughts, God's thoughts, as we move into this express lane of things unfolding for us. So our text today from Colossians chapter 3, verse 10 says, put on, put on a new nature. That's right. Did y'all get dressed today? What'd you put on? Did you put on a new nature? That's biblical. It's scriptural. It's truth. Put on a new nature and be renewed as you learn how your creator exists and works and manifests and you become like God, this divine presence. Put it on because let me tell you, this has been waiting for you, laying there all along. That's right. You know how you got something in your back of your closet and you discover, oh, I haven't worn that. Oh, that looked good. I can't wait. 
How many of you are waiting for the seasons to change so you can bring out those spring outfits, those summer clothes, those things that you've all been waiting all year long to wear, but now you're today thinking, oh, flannel and wool and sweaters and, you know, because it's chilly and cold and think, oh, I could put that on in a few weeks. Well, the wonderful nature of the divine is there. Put on your true or your new nature. It's not new in a sense of something that's new to you. It's something in sense of a change, meaning put on this that has been waiting for you all along. It is your true nature. It's who you really are. You know, you're not really this physical being. I hate to tell you this. You're something so much greater because I know you've been focusing a lot that this is all I am. But you're so much more. This wonderful spiritual entity in this world and it's calling you to get dressed in that way. Dress up for the occasion of being the spiritual person that you're called to be and to live in this world. Put on this nature. And it's simply then in that process that you're learning to know this creator, this manifester, this one who's been doing the miraculous. You're beginning to learn and to know and to understand for this wisdom then is calling you to balance and to weigh things out in ways that say, I get it. I now understand stand wisdom is asking what does love do and what does how does love think and how does love act and how does love work in this situation and suddenly i begin to see new light on scripture on guidance on how to live my life and i just stepped into the express lane because how you think will require first and foremost taking a little inventory <sighs> okay let's get serious a big inventory because a little one ain't going to do you such good. It's going to have to be pretty big, a full-out, blown-out inventory. That's right. This week with the college kids, we're having to do an inventory on every piece of furniture in the three floors of this building. Furniture in the closet? Mm-hmm. We'll try to get it out of the closet. But, you know, some while you got something found in a closet. We got all kinds of stuff in this building. Well, we have to do a major inventory to get a total uh, analysis of everything we have. And sometimes in our lives, we've got to do a major inventory to say, I need to look at all the thoughts that have been happening in my life. And you know, in the good old-fashioned way, some of those thoughts need to be cleaned out. I don't know about you, but did your mother ever come at you with a bar of soap and a wash rag saying, mm -mm, I catch you saying that one more time. I'm going to wash your mouth out. Anybody have that experience? How does soap taste? You all can relate to that one? <laughs> Ivory is not very good. Mm -mm. Now, it's not delicious in any ways, but it's about this kind of a spirit of cleansing and washing out, getting out. Sometimes we've got to take a wash rag and a bar of soap, shall we say, and get to work on some of the thoughts that we've been thinking. We've been thinking things like God is not for me or God is withholding or God is keeping something from us in some way because we haven't been good enough. Let's wash that one out. God wants to judge me, and we're thinking, ooh, be careful. You know, God's looking down and wanting to judge you for every single thing you do and say. Let's wash that one out. God does not want me to have fun. Ooh, I love this one because, you know what, as a young kid in the church, growing up as a preacher's kid, I just thought there was never going to be any fun for us in church. You know, we can't dance, we can't chew, we can't go with girls who do. You know, what is this all about? You know? I just, I'm telling you, how are we ever going to have any kind of fun? Let me tell you this. Ooh, a spiritual life, vibrant and full, is one of the most incredible rides of a lifetime. Full of amazing unfolding of the miraculous. Full of these wonderful aha moments of the divine unfolding for you. Get this one out of your head that God doesn't want you to have fun. Let's remove that. I'm innately good, no good. How about that one? Ooh. Get some soap and do some extra scrubbing on that one because you've been told a lot. You're not innately good, but instead, all we can see is that nasty stuff inside you and that, you know, been pointing out how bad you are and how evil your ways are and you've come from sin, extra S's, sin. You know how it is? Preacher's got to put that S in there. Just, you know, it's a long extended S. Why? To make it more powerful for you really feel the power of your sin sinful ways and satan is out to get you in your sinful ways you know instead we understand that god created you not as junk but as a divine creation in the infinite image 
Ooh, stop and say, I'm looking good today. Stop and say that because that's exactly, there's innately good in you. Acknowledge it, see it. Stop and see your goodness inside your life. We got to wash some of these thoughts out of our head. How about it's everybody else's fault that the way I am is the way I am. It's your fault and your fault and your fault. Mm -hmm. We need to get that one washed out because the Spirit of God's calling us to our own responsibilities where we create our own realities. So we want to wash these things out from our consciousness in some way because, let me tell you, these thoughts get embedded in our mind like that thermostat on the wall. Mm -hmm. You know how that thermostat works. You set it at this wonderful temperature, 72 degrees. Then your partner comes on, moves it down to 68. Then you move back to 72. Then they come to move to 68. And then you go back to 70. You know how it is. The thermostat responds to whatever temperature you've set it, right? And it goes in and kicks in automatically. And it will respond to exactly what it's experiencing. When the cold air comes in, it kicks in and warms it up or vice versa, right? So it is on those thoughts. They're like a thermostat in your mind. You get this experience happening kicks right in that old thought i'm not good i'm not innately good it's your fault i'm this way i'm going to blame you you know god wants to judge me i could never have any fun in this spiritual life church is so boring because why should we go to church on sunday anyway and you know what Uh, i'm just feeling like god's trying to withhold all kinds of stuff from me those automatic thoughts are kicking in like a thermostat and it's time for us to do a little removal a little disconnection, a little way that we can change our very thinking because 95% of our life is coming from this subconscious mind. Do you know what I'm talking about when I say subconscious mind? You know, deep, deep, deep. That's subconscious. Where you subconsciously are doing and moving and all those kind of things that you're doing, you know, you just adjusted your seat, you just scratched your head over there. The subconscious mind told you to do that. You didn't stop to think, should I scratch right now? No, you just did it, right? So the subconscious mind is that place where you will walk and live and operate from. It's happening subconsciously in your mind. But the subconscious mind is going to do everything to keep you there. It's going to keep you there. It's going to work on it full time. If you don't make a change deep within your thought and consciousness, you're going to be held there for a long period of time. Oh, come on. Really? Really? I don't need to change my subconscious. You'll be amazed if you do some inventory how much you are led and guided by the subconscious thoughts that have been implanted all through your life, all through the journey that it's time for us to do a big old-fashioned inventory on and do a little house cleaning with some soap and water. Get that uh, stuff removed out of our mind because the subconscious mind is the habit mind. That's right. It's the habit mind. It's the mind where you develop these kind of habits that you just do things automatically. You don't know why you're doing it. You just do them. You know what I mean? You get this, They're just out of habit. You know, you sometimes have to ask yourself, why do I do it this way? It's just, well, the subconscious has created this habit for you and you've always done it that way, so you just continue on. How about us getting into something that's really on trend right now? That's repeal and replace. Hmm, have you heard that anywhere? (laughs) Hmm. Repeal and replace. A lot of people are talking about it. But today I'm talking about it in a very spiritual context. Seems that this is something powerful for us that we need to embrace. We need to repeal some of these thoughts and replace them. We need to get deep down into the subconscious and remove some of this stuff that says, I can't, it won't happen, I'm too uh, old, I'm not powerful enough, it's not going to happen for me, etc., etc., because you live them out all the time. You may think that you are full of this faith, and you're really full of faith, you wouldn't ask one another to pray for me. Pray for one another, you know? Because what are we doing when, when we pray? Are we really praying to change God? Do we really think that God's up there saying, okay, say some nice words, and maybe I'll change my attitude about you? Mm-hmm. I want to hear a nice, eloquent prayer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, try that Lord's Prayer on me. Mm-hmm. See if that one changes me. Now, nah, you've got to come up with something better, fresh. That's old. 
God's not that way. God's not out there saying, pray some prayer to manipulate me, manage me, somehow console me, somehow uh, control me in some way. God is always giving you your highest and best. But we don't believe it. The subconscious is saying, that ain't happening. That ain't real. That's just preacher talk. Then we say, would you pray for me? Because I want you to help me manipulate God. Would you pray with me? Because maybe we could massage God together and kind of get him to thinking, you know, maybe our way. And, you know, maybe we could manipulate. Would you bargain with me? I'm going to give my firstborn. Would you give your firstborn? Maybe we can get God to do something for us then. But when we're really holding in consciousness thoughts of great faith, we say, I know. We don't say, would you pray with me? We say, would you claim with me? Would you affirm with me? Because what we're really doing when we're praying is treating our doubt anyway. We're trying to manage that doubt that wants to rise up, that we're still working through, that we got to scrub out with some soap and water. We got to get that fear out. We got to get that doubt out. We got to get that questioning out. We got to get that wandering reality out. We got to clean it all out. So there's some work that we have to do. And you know what? We've got some great tools to help you with this. You know what this is called? an affirmation miracle jar. That's right, they're back there and some of you have already picked yours up. What's inside this thing? Daily affirmations. Something powerful for you to pull out every single day and read for every day up until Easter Sunday. Now, isn't it wonderful that when we open up this jar, we're going to get all kinds of wonderful truth, nuggets of inspiration, things that we can begin to think about, that when we repeal, we replace We repeal, we let go of these terrible thoughts that we've been thinking, these negative stinking stuff, the things that have been holding us back that cause us to wander in the wilderness, to move in the 85 traffic at a bogged down rate, a pace. Oh, now we get this wonderful affirmation. We read it and we're inspired and we think, oh, that was wonderful. And what do we do when we're blessed? Don't we show appreciation back and gratitude? So what we're going to do is ask you to put in a gift for God, a gift for the blessing, for the work of God, a gift for one another, a gift for the God in you and the God in each and every one of us, a gift that helps us to understand how we might create miracles together because you know what? God works through us. That's right. God works through us. How crazy it is sometimes when we think, no, God will work without me, but no, God uses you. And together, we're going to create this wonderful miracle as we take this wonderful affirmation jar and we repeal some of those thoughts and we replace. Now, this is real spiritual health care. This is an incredible. You could call this God care. I don't care. It doesn't have to be Obamacare, Trump care, or anybody else's care. It's called God care. That's what it is. It's your greatest health tool when you begin to embrace the affirmative, repealing and replace the negative, and embrace it, and do then demonstrating some gratitude. Because please, 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 hear me now. I don't want you to be a taker and not a giver. Because when you just take, 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 your spiritual life becomes like the Dead Sea in Israel. It's the lowest point on the planet Earth. And the water runs down and there's no place for it to run out. And it's simply dead. So please don't just take, 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 take. Affirmation after affirmation. Ooh, I love that. Can I have one out of your jar too? Can I have your affirmation? Because I'm going to take, 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 take. And never give. But when we give back, when we put something in the jar... We create a spiritual habit and we begin to work in the subconscious and we begin to work on the lower level of creating these habits within our lives that say, I know that what I sow, I reap. I know that as I claim these promises and I bless back, give back and share back, I know I'm in this cycle of blessing in my life. And we begin to change and we do something amazing. You know, there's a passage in Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 14 that says, how long will you grossly Will your grossly offensive thoughts lodge within you? Hmm, King James, you know, very simply saying, how long are you going to think that way, honey? How long are you going to hold on to these thoughts, these negative things that are just holding you back? Children of Israel, 40 years. How many of you got 40 years of negative stinking thinking left that you want to embrace and wander in your wilderness? Or how about we just move into the express lane? 
And that's where we let go of some of these things. Because you know what? Some of those children of Israel never made it to the promised land. That's right. They never made it to their destination. They got bogged down. They were held back in traffic. It took them forever and ever to go that 11-day journey, 40 years. And in that time, they passed out and died. Sometimes I feel like that in Atlanta traffic. Oh, Lord, I'm going to die. I got to go to the bathroom. How do we get through this traffic? I'm trying to drive home. I'm bogged down. We're going two miles an hour. Accident number four that we've passed with those blue lights circling around and the hero trucks coming. And we're like, I'm just bogged down. And I'll never make it. And sometimes in our life, that's why we're living our spiritual life. We feel like we're never going to make it to the promised land. But it, we will, we will, and you can when you're really ready to renew your mind. But some of us get stuck in a rut, you know? You're like this person. I walked down the street. I fell into a hole. I stayed there until I figured my way out. The next day, I walked down the same street. I fell in that same hole. And I stayed there until I figured my way out. Now the next day, I walked down the same street. I fell into the very same exact hole. And I stayed there until I figured my way out. And the next day, you're not going to believe this, but you're right. I walked down the same street, fell in the same hole, and I stayed there until I figured my way out. And then the next day, dawned on me, I need to walk down a different street. <laughs> you know, this is the journey of our life. Moving to the express lane requires that you put on that new nature, that you make some changes in your ways that you have to make up your mind and you have to put it in such a way that you now have a positive vision of God's unfolding power at work within your life in such a wonderful way that you're tired of saying the same old story over and over again and I hear some of you say you know what oh my life is one sinking ship after another well it's time you invest into a life preserver it's time you make some changes it's the time we move out to get into the express lane so I want to share with you some real quick tip, and that is one, start visualizing in your mind that answer. Start visualizing your promised land. I think how amazing it would have been if the children of Israel said, I see the promised land. I know where I'm going. I know where I'm headed. I see this. I got some pictures of it. I know what it looks like. Oh, it's going to be beautiful when we get there. It's going to change everything. Because you know what? It's so amazing when we hold those thoughts and visuals in mind, they change everything and they influence that subconscious action within us. Wayne Dyer said, I put up, he's a great author and great teacher who's passed away. He said, you know what? I put this sign up on my mirror that was my visual for every day. And you know what it said? No one is going to ruin this day for me. Wow. No one, even me. I'm not going to ruin this day for me. No one else is going to ruin this day for me. I'm moving out because this day is a glorious, wonderful, fabulous day, and I'm headed to the promised land. That's what he wanted to convey, and that's what he wanted to see every single day. He wanted to convey to his thought life that this is the way we do it. This is how it shapes, and this is how it unfolds. So you know what it is? It's about actually pouring into your mind the exact opposite thought you're thinking this way now you're thinking that way getting wisdom is really about getting a sense of direction for your spiritual life a set of direction for your journey set of direct a sense of direction of where you're headed i was married and my ex-wife wasn't gifted with a sense of direction she would head out of the driveway and i would constantly say honey i'm going to tell you this if you think you should turn left always go right. You know, it's going to be so much better for you because you just have no sense of direction at all. And if you're thinking left, it's probably right. And if you're thinking right, just go left because it's always going to be that way, it seems like, in her life because she didn't have the sense of direction. And sometimes in our lives, we're in this wandering mode because we have no spiritual sense of direction. So it's pouring in the opposite of what our thought may be. We're thinking, I'm a failure. Oh, the opposite, I'm a success. Oh, we're thinking, I can't. Oh, the opposite, I can. We're thinking, oh, the, I'm, I can't give in the offering today. Do you realize how much money I am limited with? 
And then there's the opposite thought. I'm blessed and I'm living a life of abundance and God is unfolding goodness within me. How many of you are really ready to stop the wandering reality and make that kind of change? How many of you are really ready to say, I believe and I live out this very truth? How many of you are really ready to say that I'm really ready and eager to move into an express lane of manifestation in my life? Because I want to tell you something. The express lane is H-O-V, right? High occupancy vehicle. It really means that it's not just you in the vehicle. And in your spiritual life, it's the divine within the human in this vehicle that's moving in the express lane. And when you realize that and get that, you have permission to move into the fast track, to move into the fast lane, to move into the express lane of getting to the destination where you want. When you realize the divinity is within me and it's traveling with me, it's not just my humanness alone. Oh no, I am a high occupancy vehicle and I belong in the express lane. Say amen.